Shalom, shalom. I am Claudette Whitehead and I am a graduate of Generation Impact Bible College. I want to thank Dr. Frost for the opportunity to be able to teach you tonight. And our topic tonight is number 33, the covenants. So let's open in prayer before we begin. Father God, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to spend more time with you and in your word. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that you have a good plan for us. Thank you that through the covenants, we can see your redemptive plan. We can see your purposes. Thank you, Lord, that you will bind my mind, my will, and my emotions to your mind, will, and emotions as I teach. I pray that for each of the people that are listening to this teaching, that you will touch their ears, their eyes, and their mind so that they will grow and learn what they need to from this session. I ask this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So, tonight we're going to be looking at covenants, as I said. And when we think of covenants, you might think, oh, what is the point? But if we do not study the covenants, which are the backbone of the storyline of the Bible, it shows, which shows how everything fits together, we actually miss the plan, the strategic plan that God had. God is a God of strategy, not a God of chaos. He had a strategic plan for relationship with us, and he continues to want that with us. So when we look at this definition of covenant, it is an agreement between man or an agreement between God and man. And the word covenant comes from the Hebrew, berith, and it means treaty, alliance, pledge, or cutting. In Greek, it is diatekhe, which means to properly set agreement, a last will and testament. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a deeper understanding of that word covenant. It's not just about marriage. So there are two kinds of covenants spoken of in the Bible. There are conditional and unconditional covenants. And when we talk later about the seven different covenants that we're going to delve into, they are either conditional or unconditional. So the conditional covenant depends on if you do this, I will do this. The Bible says in Exodus 19 verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. It says, if you will indeed obey, then both parties have conditions to fill. Both parties have something that they have to do. The unconditional covenant depends on God only. It's an I will or the word says in Genesis 9 verse 11, Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God remains faithful, even if we don't. That is an unconditional covenant. So when we look at these seven covenants, for each covenant there is a seal, something that shows us the reality of the covenant. So the Adamic covenant is the first one. And this was God created the earth. Um, he then created Adam and Eve. And now he establishes covenant with them. Covenant relationship with them. And this first Adamic covenant is a conditional covenant. There's conditions which Adam has to fulfill. And this covenant was from Adam till Noah and to all people. Adam's responsibility in this covenant relationship with God was to obey God and to bring all creation under submission to his authority and dominion. So the word says that you have been given dominion. There were consequences, though, to his disobedience. This covenant didn't have a seal. It was purely given by God's love. Out of love, God wants relationship with Adam. Adam had to name the birds and animals he was to be fruitful and multiply, and he was to have dominion. But there's a negative side to this covenant. Genesis 2 verse 16 to 17 says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. If you do this, then I will do this. If you don't do this, then I will do this. So when we look at Adamic, it is a conditional. I have to do something, then God does something. 
Then the second covenant that was established was in the time of Noah. So if you think about Noah's time, uh, the Bible says that in Noah's time, there were no men who were righteous. Adam, Noah was the only righteous man in the time. Noah's covenant was unconditional. It was an everlasting covenant that God made with all creation. It wasn't going to end. It would be there forever. Genesis 9 verse 15 to 16 explains this. I will remember my covenant, not your covenant or you if you do this, my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So the floods have happened, God's destroyed everything, and God resets. He resets. He doesn't want a world full of unrighteous people. He resets everything. And he says, I will reestablish humanity. He gives Noah all the original blessings and privileges and obligations that he gave to Adam. It's a starting over. A starting over by grace. It's a God who loves us saying... You messed up, but I love you. I'm going to fix it. And that's what God does the whole way through the Bible. The third covenant that we see is the Abrahamic covenant. This is an unconditional, everlasting covenant. It has no expiry date. It lasts till today. As Christians, we today have the privilege of all the blessings that were given to Abraham in Genesis. Abraham just had to believe and trust. When he believed, it was accounted to him for righteousness, Romans 4 verse 3 says. So in Genesis, we see, Genesis 12, it says, all the families on the earth will be blessed. If you and I are on the earth, we will be blessed. If we have believed, if we have faith, if we've given our hearts to Jesus, we are going to be blessed. Genesis 15, in Genesis 15, this is how the, the covenant comes to be. Abraham asks God what his reward will be for his childlessness. God shows him the stars and tells him how numerous his descendants will be. But Abraham wants proof. He asks for some animals. God asks for some animals and he says to Abraham, lay them down, cut them in half. And he then puts Adam, Abraham to sleep. Abraham's asleep when God cuts this covenant. It's called a cutting of a covenant in verse 9 and 10. And God appears as a smoking oven and a flaming torch between the pieces of the animals in verse 17. Essentially, he is making the covenant with himself as Abraham, Abraham slept, giving him the land of Canaan. So he makes these promises, the promises for land and love and care and blessing. He gives those promises while Abraham's sleeping. He's cutting this covenant with himself. Hebrews 6 verse 13 says, For when God made the promise to Abraham, he swore an oath by himself, since he had no one greater to whom, by whom to swear. And I have to share with you that the Old Testament had treaties, and they were called either suzerain vassal treaties or parity treaties. We don't understand that because we don't have that today. But suzerain vassal, suzerain means sovereign power, and vassal is the servant uh, or the lesser power. And the suzerain vassal treaty was between the stronger and the weaker, and it was, I will bless you if you're loyal and obedient to me. And it's normally between a ruler and some kind of servant or weaker person. The parity treaty, which is, an, is like the Abrahamic covenant explains, is between two kings of equal power. So when God walks through the animals as a smoking oven, okay, or a flaming torch, he is doing that covenant. He's making that covenant with himself. He is the stronger power. It's between him and Jesus. They are the two kings of equal power. And the agreement then is to fight for each other like family. God is making a covenant that says he will fight for us like he's our family. When they did this, they walked between the cut and half animal and they committed to one another. 
that they may go their separate ways. So when they're walking separately, okay, so they're walking between like that. So when they're walking separately, they will always come back again and meet together. This uh, covenant has a seal of the circumcision. It is a covenant of grace, but the seal is circumcision. And in Genesis 17, it's verse 1 to 4, it speaks about circumcision being the outward sign of the covenant. When God changed Abraham's name to Abraham, it was an outward physical action of an eternal covenant, a covenant between God and the Jews. Today, it is circumcision of the heart. We are circumcising our heart, cutting off the old life and bringing in the new in Galatians 5 and 6. We see this. Genesis 22 verse 17 speaks of Abraham's descendants being like stars of the heavens, which is re resembling the Christians, Abraham's spiritual seed, and sand on the seashore, the Jews, which are Abraham's physical seed. So this covenant is not just for the Jews, it's for the Jews and the Gentiles. All will serve God by faith and can have the promises Abraham was promised in Deuteronomy 28. Acts 7 verse 8 says, Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the patriarchs. I love the story of circumcision when I think of the fact that prothrombin K, which is the clotting factor in blood, is strongest on the eighth day. How amazing that they only discovered this recently in scientific studies. But in the Old Testament, they already were acting on obedience to God to do it on the eighth day when the human body has the highest level of prothrombin K, which means after circumcision, the healing is much quicker. Galatians 3 verse 9 says, All who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of faith. This is a covenant, an unconditional, everlasting covenant where you believe and you trust. And God seals it by circumcision. The fourth covenant that we have is the, cover, the Mosaic Covenant. This is a covenant that is conditional and temporary. So, I want you to think about this. Noah has established, he's been given an, a second chance. Abraham has been given a covenant where he is blessed and he will get land, even though at the time when he asked, he didn't have any children and his descendants were going to be like the stars and the sand. And I don't know about you, but that's a lot of, that's a lot of descendants. <clears throat> but the Mosaic Covenant comes now when Moses and the people have been led out of Israel and in, out of Egypt, sorry. They've been led out of Egypt and they are wandering around in the desert. They're cruising around in the desert and... God is looking and saying, okay, wait a minute. These people need structure. They need rules. They actually do not know what to do or how to live right. And it's a temporary covenant made by God and the nation at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 to 24. It brings the law, the Ten Commandments, and the people are needing these limitations. The law, the seal of this covenant was the law, and it had to teach grace. When we realize that we cannot fulfill the law, we recognize how much we need grace. In fact, when you think about this covenant, the Bible speaks about 613 laws that you had to obey. 240 say, 248 say do this and 365 say don't do this. So I don't know, I'd be confused even just by don't and do. Um, now you've got to remember all of those covenants and how quickly would you actually break those commandments. If you kept the covenant, you would go into the promised land, but if you didn't, you wouldn't. There's no way any one of us can keep the law. There's no way any one of us is perfect enough. Jesus had to stand in the gap for us. The purpose of the law was to point us to Jesus. It wasn't to tell us how bad we are. It was to tell us that Jesus is here. He is our Savior. And you cannot do this alone. By God's grace, we have Jesus. It showed the people the need of a Savior. 
as our sin nature is always going to mislead us. Because of sin, we're always going to make mistakes. Because of sin, we're going to always do things wrong. <clears throat> Love as our motive now covers the Ten Commandments. We don't need the Ten Commandments when we love. If I love you, I'm not going to steal from you. If I love you, I'm not going to have an affair with your husband. If I love you, I'm not going to cheat on you. Love covers the Ten Commandments. You don't need the Ten Commandments. It's a covenant that is especially significant because it promises to make Israel a kingdom of priests and a holy nation if they obey in Exodus 19 verse 6. We are no longer in this old covenant because of Jesus, because of our Savior, because we've been shown that we need a Savior. We don't have to fulfill the rules of the old covenant. Exodus 34 verse 28 says, So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So here the people now have laws and rules to obey. As you can see, and as we all know, if you've read the Bible, they keep failing, they keep making mistakes, they keep doing stuff wrong. And along comes David. David, a man after God's own heart. And I love the story of David because David sinned. He sinned big time. He had an affair. He had the wife of the husband of the girl that he had an affair with, Bathsheba, killed on the front line he he really he was a baddie I, I don't think most of us have ever done the things that David has done and and we still need we all need Jesus but God called him a man after his own heart and I I really believe that's because David sinned but what he did was he recognized that he'd sinned he repented for doing the sin he changed the way that he behaved. But for me, the biggest part of David is he then helped show us how we can change. He was, he was vulnerable enough to share all his failures with us in all the Psalms that he praises God and he shares with God and he, he argues with God and he talks to God. He has relationship with the Father. Through, through this condition, uh, through this con, um, covenant, con, covenant salvation will come through David's bloodline someone will always be sitting on the throne from David's bloodline and even to this day we have a choice who's going to be on the throne of our hearts is Jesus going to be on the throne of your heart is your TV is your husband is your money are your children who's on the throne of your heart who are you putting first so the Davidic covenant is about the bloodline where Jesus came from God is committing to bring all the people who do not follow the rules in line. Jesus, our Savior, will come from David's bloodline. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't wish, need to worship in temples anymore. Yes, we go to church. Hebrews 11, 26 says, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. But we do not need to worship in temples. We have the Holy Spirit inside us. We have Jesus living inside of us when we give our hearts to him. So... We welcome in the presence of God and he sits on the throne of our hearts. The seal of this covenant is praise. Like I said earlier, David was the perfect example of praise. We have hundreds of psalms where David praises God. He cries out to God. He complains to God and then he praises God. Psalms is like a prophecy of Jesus Christ. There are so many prophetic words in psalms about Jesus. They signify praise. David understood the relevance of praise in our lives. He took the Ark of the Covenant, he placed it on Mount Zion, and he re this represents direct intimacy with God. God inhabits the praises of the people. 2 Samuel 7 verse 12 to 16 says, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him. I will establish the throne of my kingdom forever. My mercy will not depart from him. As I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. 
Your throne shall be established forever. The throne of God is established through Jesus. You and I still have the choice today as to who we're going to put on the throne of our hearts. Then the final covenant. This is the pinnacle, the new covenant, the everlasting covenant. We live in this dispensation now. We are now in the dispensation of the new covenant. It is not an if you do this, then I will do this. It's not dependent on righteousness, but Christ's. It establishes the fact that when I believe, when I choose to follow Christ, I establish the covenant and I am righteous because of Christ in me. I am righteous because of what Christ did. I am righteous because of Christ living in my heart. This covenant was, was um, prophesied in Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 32, and Ezekiel 11, verse 9, and we are reminded in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3, Jesus brought complete forgiveness of sin, giving us a new heart. He comes from the line of David and was restored, and has restored what the first Adam lost. The first Adam lost what God wanted. In the garden, there was relationship. But because of Adam's sin, we lost relationship with God. Jesus came to restore that relationship. And our only decision is, yes, Lord, I love you. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and I commit my life to you. I put you on the throne of my heart. I will follow you. I will, I will listen to Holy Spirit. I will lead, be led by Holy Spirit. I will submit to Holy Spirit. You become more. I will become less. We don't have to go via the priest in the Old Testament. We can get into the Holy of Holies. The veil was torn. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn. The veil separated the people from the Holy of Holies. We can go into the Holy of Holies. This seal, when Jesus, when God uh, gave this covenant, the seal was, and you are sealed by my covenant, the Holy Spirit, it is a seal of grace in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 22. We have the supernatural ability to do what God called us to do. God is not just judging us. He's gracious and merciful. And the very things he did in the Old Testament, we are doing today and accept as normal. Be careful. We will be judged. Do not think that God is not noticing. He notices. He, he's keeping a record. But the record is obliterated as far as the east is from the west when you say, forgive me, I choose you. We will see the power of God in our time. Matthew 26 verse 28 says, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. My sins are forgiven because of this new covenant, because of Jesus dying on the cross, because of his blood. Hebrews 8 verse 6 to 9 says, I give you a better covenant. Yes, there were covenants before, but this is a better one, which is established on better promises. Verse 7 says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. So if the first covenant was perfect, we wouldn't need the second. It is a new covenant, not like the old, because people did not follow that covenant. People couldn't follow that covenant. And because you cannot follow the covenant in the Old Testament, God had to disregard you because he's a holy God. But he sent a savior that saves us from our sins, Jesus. Galatians 2 verse 21 says, If righteousness, righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. We needed Jesus to die to save us. And the final covenant will be when Jesus comes in the second coming, where we have a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. The same tree of life from the Garden of Eden will be flourishing there. And we will be able to eat from this tree because there is no sin. Because of sin, we could not live forever. Because of Jesus, we can live forever. This tree of life is the seal of this new covenant, this everlasting covenant, this final covenant. And I will be able to see 
the tree of life, the same tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden that allowed Adam and Eve to have relationship with God will be in the New Jerusalem. I will be able to eat from this tree of life. Revelations 22 verse 14 says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Did you notice how the covenants progressively build upon one another, forming a complete redemptive storyline? What happened in, in Noah's time? God preserved the world. He gave them a restart, a reset. He pressed the button. He said, let's start again. With Abraham, he initiated redemption. He says, yeah, I'm giving you a blessing. It's forever. In Moses, because of Moses, he established the nation of Israel. Because of David, we are promised an eternal shepherd king that will be on the throne. Jesus will always be on the throne. From the time of David, there was someone from the line of David on the throne. We have our eternal king now, Jesus, who is on the throne. And this was final, leads us to the final covenant, Jesus' new covenant. The final covenant that seals everything. With each new covenant, we were given promises and plans from God to continue to save a people that would not listen, a people that would not be obedient. The original plan to save the world through the seed of the woman that was spoken of in Genesis becomes clearer and clearer until we finally see that redemption can only come through our King Jesus. So they had rituals in the Old Testament as well to fulfill these covenants that they made, the covenants from man to man. And some of the examples are quite interesting in the Bible. The first one is they'd exchange clothes, cloaks. So I take my cloak off and I give it to you and you take your cloak off and you give it to me. And it means that I, I, all I have, I give to you and all you have, you give to me. There's a sharing that happens. They would swap belts. The swapping of a belt means you have my wealth and army and I take yours. They would cut the animal in half like we saw in the covenant with Abraham where he was sleeping. God cut the covenant with himself. It means a dying of, of self and may I not end up worse than this animal. I'm going to keep this covenant because I do not want to be cut in half like this animal. Another way in, that in which they would set up a covenant was they would put up a pillar that God would see. The covenant was for their descendants as well. What they were doing was a physical sign that showed you that there was a covenant between them and God that everybody else could see through the generations. They would cut their wrists and the blood would mingle. You would not mess with a person who was in covenant because you didn't know how strong their partner was. A lot of the time people would say, don't mess with me, I'm in covenant. And the people would be scared of that because they didn't know who the person had mixed blood with. It could have been a really strong king and you were actually a bit of a peepee jawler and you were going to be in trouble. They would exchange names. So God, when he cut his covenant with Abraham, he was Abraham. And that H that is added into his name is the H for God. So he became the God of Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, you and me through the blessings that God gave to Abraham. They would also eat a covenant meal together. This is me to you and we have become one. We're sharing, we're in relationship with one another. When we think about the covenants, I don't know about you, but I'm like, wow. Again and again, as we read the Bible from the beginning to the end, we see that he starts with, with, with Adam and he ends in Revelation with all the promises of the future, new Jerusalem. And what is God saying again and again and again to you and I? I love you. I care about you. I have a plan. Trust me and believe in me. All Abraham had to do was trust and believe. And when he trusted and believed, it was counted to him as righteousness. You and I can be counted to as righteousness when we believe that Jesus died on the cross, when we choose to serve him, when we repent for the sins that we have committed. The blood will cover us again and again and again and again. 
I'm so grateful to God that he loves me and that he loves you too. And Father God, right now, as we just close up this session, I just want to thank you so much for your everlasting covenants, your covenants that show me that you love me, your covenants that show me again and again that you had a plan, your covenants that show me that I might be fallible, but you still love me and you will still reach out to me. Help me to trust you more. Help me to love you more. Help me to submit more to the truth of your word and bless each one of us as we go away from here today. God bless you and I pray that you've learned and grown.